Welcome to Quest's online service. I hope you guys have had a good week so far and I'm so glad that you were able to join us this morning. Our mission here at Quest is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ because our relationship with God never stops growing. Last week, Pastor Les talked about having a big faith and how we can grow our faith through these five things that happen in our lives. There's not just one way to grow our faith, but several ways. Here's Pastor Les with five things that grow your faith. Last week, we talked about this whole idea of faith and how God wants us to have a big faith and not just 
faith in faith, you know, for faith's sake, but faith that, you know, God is who he says he is and that he's going to do everything that he promised he would do. Um, you know, a faith that when things happen, and they will, that we're just not shaken, that we can get through it, that we can have confidence that, that God is out there, that God cares about us, that God is somehow in control, and maybe we don't understand it, maybe we don't totally see it, but we just, we have faith of, and, and confidence that, uh, that God's going to take care of it. When, when we see a person that has great faith, um, it's attractive. We're thinking, wow, I wish I could have that. I wish that I could respond that way. How, how can I get some of that? Um, you know, how, how much better our life would look like if we had big faith, if we had great faith that things are going to work out. I mean, right now, um, the uncertainty of this COVID situation has certainly had me stressed, and, and I'm sure it's had a lot of you stressed as well, but think about how if we have a great faith and a confidence and a trust that, that God's in control, think of how, what's going to happen with our stresses and, and our fears. I mean, wouldn't that be a great thing to have? I mean, wouldn't it be great to go to bed at night and not be consumed with worry and actually be able to rest knowing that God's got this. God, God's under control. Got, got things under control. So early in this pandemic, I, I told some friends that, wow, if God doesn't have everybody's attention through this, um, I'm not sure what it's going to take. Um, my desire is that when all of this passes and we get beyond COVID-19 and it's just something in the history books that we can look back and say, you know, God used that time to to help build in me a big faith. I want that for you. I want that for me. And you know what? God wants that for us as well. I mean, last week we started out by saying that the whole um, divide, the whole break in the relationship between God and man happened over the issue of trust, that, uh, that man didn't trust God, that Adam and Eve thought that they knew better than God did. And um, we also looked at this story of the Roman centurion and how that centurion, who was, you know, confident, military leader, had several soldiers under him, went to Jesus and says, can you heal my servant? And it, that passage said that Jesus was amazed at the at the great faith of the centurion, that he believed that Jesus could heal his servant. That passage showed to us that when we have great faith, that it honors our heavenly father. And when there's trust and faith in any relationship, it's a good thing, right? I mean, uh, when husbands and wives trust each other, that, the marriage is better. When, uh, when kids trust their parents and parents trust their kids, the family dynamic is better. In, in a work situation, when there's trust, it's better. And so when we trust and have faith in our Heavenly Father, it honors Him. It honors that relationship. And it's really kind of a display of what Christianity is all about. Last week, I introduced you to these five things. The five things that that show up when people tell their story of faith and how God worked in their life and how their faith grew. And there's there may be more than five, but these are things that we've seen that show up. And so we're going to be talking about those. Um, practical teaching is, is one where, you know, God shows us where we need to go. He shows us where we're at, and then he points us to where we need to go. There's providential relationship where somehow God speaks to us through relationships, through friendships with other people. There's private disciplines that align our hearts, things that we do that align our hearts with God's heart. And personal circumstances where God either causes things or allows things to happen and it gets our attention. And then personal ministry where opportunities that 
we actually get to experience God's power and to see God show up. So today we're going to look at three of those things. Next week, we're going to look at the last two. The first one we're going to look at is this idea of practical teaching. And it's practical biblical teaching, of course, you know, principles from the Bible. Um, And so when people talk about their faith, it kind of goes like this, where people say, you know, somebody invited me to a Bible study. And, you know, I was like, Bible study? I don't know about that. But wow, you know, there was some really, really helpful things that came out. And I just... I had no idea that the Bible could really relate to my life right now in 2020. Um, And so it was practical. And so we learned how it connected with our life. That's that's practical teaching, practical application of Scripture. We're going to look at a passage in Matthew chapter 7. And and Jesus had just given an overview of the new value system that had to do with Christianity. And it was... It was pretty radical, even even back then. Um, like ideas, like if somebody asks you for a favor, do the favor and do even more. If uh, if you have an enemy, and you know we all have enemies at time times, um, don't hate them. Pray for them. And you're like, wow, that's kind of opposite of what seems normal because what comes automatic is to hate them. Well, I know that, but that's Christianity. Is you need to pray for your enemies. That if somebody wrongs you, you need to forgive them. Well, I don't, I don't feel like it. Well, that's probably when you need to do it most is forgive even when, when you don't feel it. And the other one was like, if you want to be rich in, in, by God's standards and in God's eyes, then, you know, don't hoard your money, but you need to give it away. You need to find opportunities to be generous. And so totally Um, upside down value system. And he had just kind of laid this out to his followers. And then he continues with this. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it, you know, kind of what he had just talked about. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds his house on a solid rock. Jesus was saying that if you build your life on his teaching, on the practical teaching of scripture and the principles we find there that we're going to have a solid foundation for our life. Just like if you built a house, you would want to build a house on a solid foundation. So the house would stand. I mean, Cy Young, if you built a house and it wasn't on a solid foundation. And so he's saying that simply believing, it's not enough because we can say, oh, I believe in God. I, I believe that. But we're talking about applying it, the application of it. In verse 25, he says, you know, in that same story, he said, though the rains come in torrents and floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock, on solid rock, on solid foundation. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey is foolish, like a person who built their house on the sand, the the shifting sand. And so his principle there is basically that if you just believe and you don't apply it, you don't do anything about it, guess what? You're still in the category of being foolish. And, you know, none of us wants that. It says when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it's going to collapse with a mighty crash if it's built on the sand. When Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of the religious law, because Jesus's teaching moved people to to actually action, to do something. You know, the, the other teachers were, it was all about filling your head. It was about, you know, here, you need to know more. And we've had that. But Jesus was about, I want you to do more. These are things that I want you to do. I mean, our goal at Quest is that you would experience a changed life. We don't want you to just know things. We want your life to be changed. And one of the ways that God does that, and I think the starting point for all that, is is to learn principles from God's Word, from the Bible, and know how they connect and how they apply in your your day-to-day life. So it's practical application, and the whole idea of practical application is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's something that you do every single day of your life. That's why at Quest, 
our messages are practical because we want you to be able to see what you need to do, how this applies in your life, the, the practical application. So when we teach, we're, you know, it may seem simple, but we want to make it very, very clear um, about not just knowing something, but here's how it works in your life. And it's kind of like this. If you had a bucket of paint and you're going to, you know, paint the wall of your house and you buy this paint and you think it's a beautiful color. Hey, okay, come over to my house and look at my bucket of paint. Isn't, isn't the bucket of paint beautiful? And you're like, probably, but I think it's supposed to be on the wall. <laughs> you know, I'm, you're supposed to use that and apply it. So paint doesn't do you any good if it stays in the bucket. It's the application of that paint that makes the difference. And it's the application of the things that we learn, the practical teaching, the things that we learn from God's word. And it's that's what makes the difference in, in our lives. I mean, sure, God wants you to be obedient, but that starts with practical teaching that it's clear what you need to do and that you're actually inspired to do it. The next thing that God uses to grow our faith, faith is this thing called private uh, disciplines. Now, none of us like that word discipline, kind of the D word. We kind of push back from that. Um, but sometimes people start something that's a discipline and then it becomes a passion, something that they love. You know, some of you, and I can't relate to this, but I know some of you, you know, you like to run, you like to walk, you like to exercise. Maybe some of you are like really into healthy eating and it's very possible that that started as a discipline, something that you know that was good for you, something that you should do. You didn't really feel like it, but then you became, it became enjoyable and, and you, you did that. So um, sometimes something starts as a hobby, the discipline that goes with a hobby and you learn the guitar, you learn how to play the piano. I mean, sometimes disciplines are samok, like the other D word, like having a diet. Um, but disciplines almost always are something that in the end, when, once you get through the initial difficult part, there's something at the end that's good for you. You know, if, if you have the discipline of studying, what happens? You have better grades. If you have the discipline of exercise, then, you know, it, it might not be fun in the beginning. It might be hard, but then you enjoy it. And, you know, you're, you're healthier as a result and eating healthy. So all of those disciplines help. Um, you know, but discipline always starts out as something that you really, it's kind of difficult to do, but you're going to do it anyway. And these private disciplines are the same way. Um, and we call, they're, they're actually spiritual disciplines, but we're calling them private disciplines because typically they're done in private. They're things that we're not doing out in public for people to see. But one of those private disciplines is that I think God wants us to learn the discipline of practicing generosity, of, of seeing our finances and our resources um, through his eyes, with, with his perspective. And here's how he kind of lines it out in Matthew's gospel. He says, watch out, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. I mean, Jesus doesn't specifically use the word disciplines. He uses the word good deeds. But he's saying when you do them, you know, they're not out there for you to flaunt or saying, here, look what I did. You know, I did this. No, he said that's not what it's all about. But he says when you give to someone in need, verse 2, he says, don't do it as the hypocrites do. You know, the they're out there blowing their trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their charity. Look at what I did. Look how much I gave. Look at the impact I had because I'm so generous. He said, I tell you the truth, that's all the reward they'll ever get. He, see, back then they had the idea because, you know, religiosity and even today religion is really something that's outward. He says, no, this is something that's inward you know, if your desire is to get noticed, go for it. That's probably all the reward you're ever going to get. But verse three, he says, but when you give to someone in need, don't, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything, even what's done in private, 
will reward you. Wow. So Jesus connects generosity and financial giving and, and that discipline of doing it the right way with somehow he's going to reward us. So he's pleased with that. So when we give a percentage of our income, and you know, I think when that we should as Christians give regularly, um, we, we should have a plan of what we're going to give to to kingdom causes through the church, through through charity. And when we do that and make it a priority, it's a percentage, it's a priority of saying, I'm going to do this first, you know, before I do all the things I want to do with my money, but to see it with his perspective that God allowed me to earn this. And so I'm going to honor God with my finances and practice that spiritual discipline of giving. And he honors it. He's honored by that display of faith. In fact, he uses that to grow our faith. Um, you know, I think this pandemic has caused a lot of us to be scared and some of us maybe to be kind of tihik because, you know, well, you know, I, I, you know, or if I give, then I won't have enough money. And it's kind of made us even more scared with that. But I think the times that God shows up or the times that we find it most difficult and challenging to let go and, and start to exercise that you know, private discipline and the spiritual discipline of, of giving. God, God honors that. Another example is prayer. Um, Jesus continues in Matthew chapter 6, and he says this. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where, where everybody will see them. He said, I tell you the truth, that that's all the reward they're ever going to get. Oh, I got noticed. Well, he, he's such a good prayer, you know. Wow, look at him. Look at him go. Look at him pray. Isn't that awesome? He says, these aren't the, you know, uh, little as you go throughout the day prayers. Okay, God, give me a parking space. Thank you. Amen. You know, or things like that. This is getting alone with God, having the discipline of spending time alone with him and seeing what God wants to tell you and telling him what's on your heart. It's like I said, it's it, private disciplines are aligning our hearts with God's heart. You know, when we do it with generosity, it's helping us see our finances the way that God sees it. When we pray, it's, uh, it's hearing from God because that's how we get to converse with him. We don't have to go through anybody else as a believer in Christ, as a follower, in, a follower of Christ. You have direct access to your heavenly father in prayer. So let, let's do that and when we do that when we practice that discipline you know waking up in the morning and say i'm gonna before anything else before all the distractions come in i'm gonna just spend time with god i'm gonna meditate i'm gonna pray i'm gonna open god's word and see what he has to say to me god's gonna use those things those private disciplines to to grow our faith um, jesus modeled that um, mark tells us before daybreak the next morning jesus got up and he went out to an isolated place to pray. Well, you think, Jesus? Well, I mean, what does Jesus need to pray for? He's Jesus. But Jesus modeled that discipline for us. Um, you know, we, we automatically pray about things that are beyond our control, right? Um, nobody has to say, okay, well, uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, you can't control it. <laughs> You're scared. So don't forget to pray. No, we're all we're all praying about that. But he's saying, spend the discipline of prayer, not just for your needs, but God, what do you want to tell me? God, what do I need to, to learn here? So begin the day as an expression of faith. Jesus did. Jesus modeled it, and we should too. So taking the time and carving that time out of our schedule to, to exercise those private disciplines that God is going to use to grow your faith. Well, the third thing and the last thing we're going to talk about today is this, uh, this other thing God uses because he uses something called providential relationships that when people talk about their faith journey, a lot of times they're saying, you know what, I met this person at work and there was just something different about them. I couldn't really tell what it was, but as I got to know them, I found out that they were a believer, that they were, you know, they, they were Christian and they, they had faith. They had a strong faith. And, and that's what it was. That was the difference. And so 
And God used that relationship or I met this person. I had this roommate in college and you know, it turned out they were a, a Christian. And, and it was kind of like, I didn't ask God give me a Christian roommate. It, it just happened. And so we call them providential because it, it seems like it's an accident and it seems like it's a coincidence, but it's, there's a God thing to it. It's providential. I mean, I remember in high school, you know, typical struggles of a teenager, you know, self-esteem, acceptance, you know, friend issues, girlfriend issues, um, body image issues, all the things that go with being a teenager. And I meet this guy called, his name was Coach Scroggins. He was the coach in our school, the football coach. I wasn't even on his football team, but you know what? He saw me and he came up to me and wow, he had such an incredible impact in my life. Just building me up, encouraging me, praying for me, being there for me. I can't imagine what my high school experience would be like if it wasn't for God having that providential relationship of Coach Scroggins just show up in, in my life. Um, we know for sure that God uses people in our life to, to grow our faith. And you've probably seen that. You, you, you've seen it happen already, but... We need to leverage the healthy relationships in our life, the things that are good for us, because, you know, there's going to also be plenty of unhealthy relationships, people that you have to work with, people that maybe you go to school with that are going to influence you and, um, and it's probably influence you sometimes for things that you know that you shouldn't do or places that you shouldn't go. And so we need to leverage the healthy relationships and, and surround ourselves with that. So, um, as a Christian, we have to have relationships with other people, even the people that maybe aren't good for us, because maybe we're going to be the providential relationship for them, but we have to be intentional that things are, are balanced. We have to, to put ourselves in environments where those providential relationships can, can happen, uh, because we're, we're never tempted to do good things. You know, those come, but we can't say, you know, wow, I was tempted to do good. You know, we, we have to be intentional about that, but we're certainly tempted to do bad things. And so we have to be careful with our relationship. A, a couple of the wisest men in the world said this in, in Proverbs. He said, walk with the wise and you'll become wise. Associate with fools and you'll get in trouble. I mean, this is, this is an imperative with a promise and, and a warning together. Paul in 1 Corinthians tells us, don't be fooled because bad company corrupts good character. You've heard that. You, maybe you didn't even know it was in the Bible. But we think bad company corrupts good character. Oh, that's for teenagers. No, sorry. It's for adults as well because bad company has corrupted um, good marriages before. Um, bad company has pulled somebody that maybe had recovered from alcoholism and pulled them back into those destructive habits. So bad company does corrupt good character even with adults. Um, so we have to be intentional about pursuing those kind of relationships that God providentially brings our way. Um, those that strengthen and also build up our, our faith. At Quest, we, we say that you know, life change, which is what we want for every person that comes through our doors or every person that's connected with us online, that, um, that life change happens in the context of relationships. Well, you know, right now we are so challenged with relationships, right? Because we're not getting together with our friends. It's just not the same. You know, church is online. Um, you know, we're doing the best we can, but we feel it happens in the context of relationships. Typically, relationships at Quest would happen in life groups. Well, and they happen in groups in Inside Out. They happen in groups in our Upstreet and Waomba. So that's when life really happens. Um, now we have digital groups and many of you are in it. We've got about 100 people that are, you know, tracking with digital groups right now that they're getting together online with Zoom, which uh, that, that's the best we can do right now with social distancing. But we're staying connected. And God is using that. I've heard stories from some of you that, you know, wow, God, I, I met this person in my digital group. And wow, you know, they're going through the same thing I'm going through. So God uses providential relationships at life. 
in our life and to grow our faith. Well, at Quest, guess what? We, we want that for you. God wants that for you. And God's going to use these things to grow your faith, the, the practical teaching, practical application of Scripture in your life, the private disciplines of you know praying and spending time alone with God and, and giving and and then in providential relationships as well. But we have to be intentional with it. And so I encourage you to do that. Um, you know, you probably look, if you haven't heard these five things before, you're saying, you know, I, I can see that. I can see where it happens. Now you have to do your part and be intentional that you expose yourself to practical teaching. Right now it's through our online content, um, private disciplines that's really all on you but we can guide you through that on you know spending time with God and you certainly have opportunities for giving we have online giving there's other people you can help in the community uh, but putting God first in your finances and then the the providential relationship so get into a digital group if you're not in one already so let me pray for you and then we'll be back here next week to discuss the last two five two, the last two of the five things that God uses to grow our faith. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, for wanting us to have a big faith in you and and it there's a benefit for us for sure because life just goes better, but it also honors you as well. And I want that for me. I want to look back on this time with COVID and see what you did in my faith. I, I want to hear the stories from the people at Quest and people that are watching and saying, you know, that whole quarantine season was rough. It was difficult. It had its challenges, but God used it in my life. And so God, help us to, to process this. Help us to have the, the wisdom to know how it looks in our life, to have the courage and the discipline to actually do it. And we pray all of this in the incredible name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Wow. I hope you gained some insight from the talk this morning. There are some discussion questions towards the end. Please take some time to talk about it with your family. I'm sure during the week you have some unforeseen stresses that come along. Don't forget to check out our FB page, Quest Fellowship, to find some useful insights and encouragement that can help you in your time of need. Well, this is it. I hope you'll join us for our midweek prayer and reflection this Wednesday at 8 p.m. God bless and have a great week.